So, thank you for everyone to come and see me today to talk about how the fish got its spots. Now, I do have to start with an apology myself because this talk really isn't about fish. So if you come to see our marine mates, you're going to see more fish downstairs in the aquarium. This talk is about an idea, a brilliant idea, or a stupid idea, depending on, on your point of view. And it came from Alan Matheson Turing, huge intellect of his time. And, and as was mentioned, hopefully you'll all know his name because of the film The Imitation Game. Now, although that film is a bit mungy in its history, it does a good job of showing just how important his contribution was to breaking the Enigma Code. It's estimated that he shortened the Second World War by about two years through that work. But that's not all he did. He also laid down the logic behind the computer before there were computers. Think about that for a second. The computers you have in your pocket now, the iPhone, that runs on the same logical structure that he was setting down when he was working. Incredible genius. But that's not all he did. But wait, there's more. He also worked on biology. And that's what I'm going to talk to you today about, because that's one of his least known theories. And the incredible thing is, if he had done any of these things, he would now be remembered for the genius he is. But the fact that he did all of them just shows you what a great loss it was in 1954 when he took his own life. But let's, let's start with what the components of his theory were. Turing asked the question, a very big question, a very philosophical question, because, you know, that's what geniuses do. They don't deal with small things. They deal with big ideas. Why should there be something rather than nothing? Why should you have matter coming together to form buildings, planets, humans? Why shouldn't it all just spread out? What creates patterns? And he had a stupid idea. He took two things that don't create patterns. He took diffusion and stable reactions. Now, diffusion, as you see here, does exactly what you think it will do. You put ink in water, that ink will spread out, and there will be, at the end, the, the water will be all one color. There won't be blotches or spots or stripes or anything. Diffusion wipes patterns out. The second thing he used was stable reactions. You take some of A, you take some of B, you slam it together, and you get C. No pattern. No stripes, no spots, nothing. Now, any sane, intelligent person would say, well, you put diffusion, which wipes out patterns, and you put those with the stable reactions, both of those are stable. You, you, you won't get patterns. But a genius like Turing says, well, let's see what does happen. And he found that if you put them together in exactly the right way, these two stabilizing mechanisms can actually be driven to instability. Stability driving to instability. Incredible idea. But let, me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. What you'll see in, uh, in, in these uh, chemical demonstrations is an, uh, an agar plate with chemicals seeded on, onto the plate. And these chemicals are allowed to diffuse, just move around randomly. And as you'll see at the moment, there's nothing there. There's no patterns. But when we kick everything off and we allow the reactions to occur, patterns start to form. Nothing has given that pattern its shape. Nothing has said, OK, the spot will start here, the spot will start here. There is no hand of God. It all happens naturally. If you take out the diffusion, nothing will occur. If you take out the reactions, nothing will occur. It's only by putting together these two stable components that you get instability. Incredible idea. But as I say, we're mathematicians, so we want to write down the mathematical components of this, and we can do that. This is what you'll see here. These are uh, computer simulations of exactly the thing you just saw. But incredibly, what I've done is change only a single parameter to produce these two different patterns. So on the, on the right for you guys, you'll see a stationary pattern. That's the ones we usually try and understand, because that's how we see biology. You don't normally have a zebra with its stripes moving. Although, saying that, there are crayfish that do have moving stripes, incredible things. Go look at them on YouTube. They're, they're beautiful. And then on, on, the, uh, on the left, you'll see the, the target pattern moving uh, uh, that we can simulate. And at this point, I'd like to say, you know, just look at that target pattern for a second. You're feeling sleepy? Very sleepy? Give me your wallets? Eh, worth a try. 
So that's what we do. We try to understand the chemical basis of morphogenesis. That was the theory was called. Where do patterns come from through mathematics? Now, this theory does incredibly well. It doesn't just do stripes and, and scroll waves that you saw. It also produces spots, many different kinds of spots. It produces little donut patterns. It produces mosaic patterns. And it produces all of them through one set of equation. Just think of that power. You have one, you've, you've written down one set of equations. And by tweaking those parameters, you get the whole of the natural kingdom. Turing was a genius. Incredible. So we can produce labyrinthine patterns. We can produce uh, cheetah spots. We can produce giraffe mosaic patterns. We can produce waistcoats like this. Beautiful. But also we can produce shell-like patterns. And here's the only fish I'm going to talk about. So soak up the aquatic, uh, aquatic friends at the moment. So you can produce shell-like patterns. You, you have your domain. You run your pattern formation. And then you can spiral them around, producing what we see as the shells. And we also can generate the fish patterns. Incredible idea. But what can the mathematics tell us about the biology? That should be what we aim for as mathematical biologists. It's no good just reproducing what nature does, because nature does that. A fish doesn't need to know how to produce spots. It does that itself. So the mathematics has to be able to predict something that we can test. One thing this theory tests, uh, predicts is that as you increase the size of the domain, your pattern should get more complex. If you have a very thin domain, you should only be able to get stripes or nothing at all. A very thin domain has nothing, slightly wider, you get stripes. Make your domain wider still, you get half spots. Wider still, full spots, and if you make it wider and wider, more and more spots. So what does this tell us? It tells us that if we have a tapered domain, so we have a body going into a tail or an arm, your pattern should get simpler. So the body could have a very complex pattern, like spots. But the tail or the arm should simplify down to stripes. Does the biology agree with this? Sometimes. This really works well for cats, the feline species. So we have cheetahs. They have spots on the body, stripes on the tail. Fantastic. The genet cat, again, spots on the body, stripes on the tail. But biology is much wider than mathematics. For every theory you throw at the biology, it will throw a counterexample back at you, which keeps me in a job, so I'm fine with that. So unfortunately, we have ring-tailed lemurs. Now, I may look happy here, but inside, I was hating them. <laughs> they, are, they don't have any spots on their body. They're all one color, just one color. Stripes on the tail. That's not allowed. Tapirs, they're even worse. They're fantastic things. I wouldn't saw them in a zoo. They have these snuffly noses. Oh, beautiful, fanciful. But when they're born, stripes and spots on their body, going to spots on their legs. What's even more insulting is that when they grow older, they completely lose all their patterns. That's insult to injury, that is. It's just not fair. But let's keep going with our successes. What else can we tell you? We can, again, tell you what size does the pattern. So all these skins you'll see have been uh, manipulated so they look the same size, but they're actually different sizes. The letter S with the number tells you how big they are. So the one in the top middle, that says S equals 1. Take that as one size, and then everything is in relation to that. So the one on the left of that, that says S equals 0.4. So that's 40% of the size of that middle one. Or is it on the right view? No, it's on the left. Okay, just checking. So that's 40%. And that says that as you increase your size, if you go to all the way up to 14 times as big as that number one, then you'll go from uh, black and white to two black and white, and then you'll get some blotches, then you'll get some spots, and then if you go even bigger and bigger and bigger, your spots will eventually disappear. And again, we see this in biology. It's a very powerful idea. We have the valet goat, one black section, one white section. The belted Galloway, black, white, black. And incredibly, when this works well, it works fantastically well, because the valet goat is about 40% of the size of the bull. But here I am showing you pictures and showing you the choice picked examples from biology that I, I want to give you. And I've also given you some where it doesn't work. But the critical question is, is this true? Do we know that this is the theory behind pattern formation? And the answer is, unfortunately, not yet but we're working on it. So last year, 
uh, we had some of the best evidence produced that we've ever had. James Sharp, uh, an experimentalist from Barcelona, lovely guy, he's also given a TED talk, so go look up, up his, it's, it's really nice. He demonstrated that if you get a mouse and you play around with its hox genes, you don't have to worry about what hox genes are, but if you play around with them, you can alter the number of fingers that this mouse has. And you can go all the way from five, six, seven, eight, nine, all the way up to 14. 14 fingers. Just think about how, how well it could play piano. And then if you go even further, no fingers at all. Not only can we do the, uh, the experimental perturbations, we can do the mathematics beside it. And we can see that exactly as we predict, we get the fingers increasing and then to nothing, and the biology goes from five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way up to 14, and then nothing. Is this correct, though? It's the closest evidence we currently have, but we don't have a direct link yet. We haven't got that this is what's happening biolog biologically, and then this matches with the mathematics. This is the mathematics, this is the biology. It's, it's, it's good evidence, but it's not complete yet. So there are still open questions, which hopefully you'll go away and answer and fill in the details. So let me bring this to some sort of conclusion and answer my original question. How did the fish get its spots? How did the zebra get its stripes? How did the giraffe get its mosaic pattern? How did I get my waistcoat? We don't know. I'm as surprised as you are. <laughs> but maybe, just maybe, we can get some sense of what is happening through the ideas of Alan Matheson Turing. Thank you very much.